had dashboards to save you from all the mud flying up. They were just a piece of wood. They had nothing else on them. But at least they had the property of being right in front of you. So anything that was on it, you saw. I assume that advertising signs started appearing on it, but not much else. Um, didn't have any feedback, no metrics about where you were going or how much gas you had. But <clears throat> as the, with the automobile age, came into the modern meaning of the word dashboard um, as we know it. And it's become a very compelling kind of concept. Um, anyone who's been in, a, in an automobile absolutely knows what it means, what kinds of information you can get to it. And um, at my age, you've seen developments in dashboards such that um, they become more and more sophisticated, sometimes too sophisticated. With modern cars, you know, it can be difficult to figure out you know, how all the controls work and can be distracting from the road, which is the main activity you're after, which kind of hints at um, a major issue in dashboards is figuring out what's the most important things to put right in front of the person who's using this to drive or manage an operation or whatever, and nothing else, nothing more, nothing that's distracting. That you know makes for a, a good dashboard design. And <clears throat> to bring this kind of more up to date, um, the concept of business dashboards um, started appearing in the 1990s. Um, and the main researcher who's worked on dashboards, Stephen Few, um, uh, spent a lot of effort kind of talking to a number of executives and in industries who said they were using business dashboards to find out what their dashboards looked like, uh, what kind of information they thought was important to go onto them, and came up with this uh, definition, these three parts, a visual display of the most important uh, information to achieve several objectives consolidated on a single screen so the information can be monitored at a glass. So, Glance. So there's three things, visual display, key performance indicators, if you will, um, single screen. Those are the, I think, accepted as the kind of, you know, if you don't have one of those, you don't have a dashboard going. And uh, the term has gained such currency. Everybody wants a dashboard, but nobody, I mean, few people adhere to this kind of definition, people who set out to um, develop one. There are many companies in the world nowadays that market dashboards for you and <clears throat> will charge a fee for them. Very few of them uh, incorporate all three of those dimensions. <clears throat> um, one of the few students <clears throat> added to this that um, seeing them as part of a larger performance management system that enables organizations to measure, monitor, manage business performance more effectively. So <clears throat> I, as I was doing work in this area, the beginning of this year and was digging into this literature, I you know, uh, uncovered um, quite a few um, articles, a few books that had been written on this, and I applied some of Hughes' principles to good dashboard design, kind of similar to what you see in infographics, you know, uh, nothing that's extraneous to the information, and the information kind of you know, having a lot to do in its form and format with the subject itself. Um, and I found entire books that were filled with hundreds of examples, not a single one of them good, as I would uh, apply Fuse definition to it. So it's a field that's ripe for uh, improvement, I think. Um, in survey research, um, there's um, a focus in operations on um, how to visualize information that's key to managing. Um, how to pull data from multiple sources, pair data that may come from information about how the questions are being asked, may come from interviewer behavior, um, and so on, and um, looking at how that changes over time. Um, the survey of family growth in the US um, kind of pioneered some of these concepts about mm, 12 years ago or so as part of the efforts that Groves and others were doing with responsive design. Um, um, producing hundreds of reports and pouring through them and digesting those to sort of get them in front of field supervisors. So the kind of origins in our field of a dashboard come from those efforts, although um, it took a number of years, I think, for people at the University of Michigan to begin synthesizing this into the idea of at a glance, one screen. Um, there are few efforts you can see elsewhere at the Energy Information Administration, um, but their dashboards have been focused on a kind of higher level, a strategic level, as opposed to day-to-day -day operations. And Frauke uh, Kreuter, um, I saw a presentation she did a couple of years ago that sort of 
you know, went a little beyond Michigan's work and showed some other examples. But that's kind of pretty much what I found in the survey world. <coughs> um, I started um, uh, focusing on this on a project that I direct, the National Health and Aging Trends Study, um, which has been done for about, see, this was its fifth year annual interviews, CAPI interviews. Uh, with an older uh, sample of about 8,000 people in the U.S. Um, and it um, was one of the projects at WestJet that um, uh, moved forward the concept of a cube, if you will, for um, producing reports on a number of activities, various kinds of paradata sources that came from different databases, unifying them or uh, enabling you to do a number of views of them and bring data together in what we call the cube format. Um, so the project was very familiar with a lot of different kinds of paradata, things like length of interview, um, you know, item non-response rates for different items, uh, interviewer costs, uh, number of contact attempts to uh, meet cases, things like that. Um, and so that was one thing that uh, kind of foreshadowed this dashboard de development. Uh, an even more important one, I think, was work that we um, started doing a couple years ago. We had a large study that um, had the requirement of multi-mode, sort of starting with face-to-face, -face, but moving to the web for some sample members. And we recognized the management challenge that's presented by multi-mode, where you may have different production operations, and you need to move cases through them. And each of them may have different ways of reporting, standard kind of databases they use. So how do you keep track of all that? How do you have a... a, a uh, how do you standardize the reporting and what's happening across those modes? So we came up with <clears throat> an approach we, to do that that we called M3. So that leads me up to the beginning of this year. Um, um, charrette is a word that's not used a lot in English. It comes from the French uh, 19th century. All these painters getting ready to go to the annual exhibition and um, not being you know, finished with their paintings in time and painting on the carts charrettes as they were going to the exhibition. So the idea is you're kind of, you know, very hastily putting something together um, with the idea that it will work, but it's like, you know, a lot of intense activity to get there, as opposed to a very um, orderly, uh, systematic, uh, highly scheduled uh, development process. Um, but because I hit on this idea in January, and we were going to the field in May, and really argued for this kind of very quick um, development process that um, meant working with a small interdisciplinary team at West Staff that was kind of under the radar of a lot of our management, so it was free to kind of try out different things and to fail, <clears throat> which is, I think, a very effective way to get things done. Um, <clears throat> so it built on M3, it built on Paradata, it also built on um, CARI, our computer-assisted recorded interview system um, that we've done a lot with at West Staff over the last 10 years and is, I think, a very uh, uh, good indicator of quality. Also on an effort that we made also on the NHAP study on uh, mobile devices, we equipped all the field interviewers with iPhones, and um, not to conduct the interviews, but to tell us everything else about what they were doing. And um, most of our field interviewers are not connected to the internet. They do their work. Um, sort of day-to-day -day in a disconnected mode, largely on their laptops, and then transmit once a day, typically. That's what we ask them to do. So um, with, it was just with the advent of these smartphones in their hands that we knew exactly what they were doing. We knew where they were. They, we knew what time they were working. And they could communicate um, pretty much instantaneously with their supervisors through text, et cetera. <coughs> One of the things that the interviewers reported they liked about it was us knowing where they were. In case they were in some dangerous area, you know, we send them into places all over the US, there was some security in knowing that you know, they could be found if necessary. So we had a pretty high level of acceptance for that. Um, so out of this M3 work, um, one of our software engineers came up with, the, with a software architecture called Portlets, <laughs> a way to um, sort of take a view into a specific database or a report that pulls from different and present it in a little sort of area of one screen and to assemble a lot of these in whatever you know, format you'd like them to be in size, position on the screen. Um, but it really, it was a, it was a, it was a kind of a, a, a 
standardized way to enable dashboards that um, <clears throat> he first applied to a, a clinical trials project, a coordinating center that was working with a number of clinics around the country, and the contract required such a dashboard. So Jerry kind of took that requirement and uh, developed this architecture, and then we quickly saw the advantages for survey operations and um, started applying it here to the NHS project. Um, the key performance indicators, uh, much of the five or four months that we spent January to getting ready in May to deploy this, were spent um, on defining exactly what were the key performance indicators. We had some that we used, some metrics like um, a common one at Westhead is um, interviewer hours per complete, just taking all the interviewer hours and dividing it by the total number of completes. So it doesn't represent the time that's worked on a specific case, but is a very useful metric as a measure of how you're doing overall against the budget. <clears throat> it can be applied to individual interviewers, regions, and so on. Um, but there were a lot of other aspects we were interested in that didn't have that kind of well-worn um, definition at Westat. So we had to do some basic work to decide what do we really want the supervisors to be looking at? What are the most important things? And then how can we visualize them? What's the most effective way to present that? So at a glance, it's apparent to most of these users, these field supervisors, what it means so that they don't have to study it or pour over it. <clears throat> so this is what um, the NHATS dashboard looked like. We just finished six months of data collection, or like tomorrow we'll be finishing it. And we, because, because of this charrette, you know, we weren't sure that we could actually produce it in time for the exhibition opening. Um, we didn't actually get this rolled out until July, kind of almost at the midpoint of the data collection period. Um, and we felt if it had taken us another month, it would have been completely beside the point because we designed it thinking about the kinds of things that are important for a supervisor to be looking at in the first half of the field period, sort of. There are different kinds of things that they might want to pay attention to in the last month or so. So <clears throat> we were happy that we kind of at least made it out in time to be useful. And <clears throat> uh, I know you can't um, see very well um, from where you're sitting what's on this, but I'm going to take you on a tour kind of looking at each of these eight portlets. Um, um, starting, let's see, I'll start at the bottom uh, with this array of photographs, but uh, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is what we came up with for this project. Um, and we played a little with the sizing um, and uh, positioning of them, um, and things moved around a little bit, but we recognized um, the most important um, part of the real estate on the screen is the upper left corner. That's what almost all our Western eyes land on when we first look at a screen. And so we wanted to make sure that that got kind of first maximum attention. And that's what we call the an anomaly portrait. Um, the uh, messages to the field supervisor about the things that are most important for them to look at that day. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but let me go on to the <clears throat> array of photographs at the bottom, what we call my people portlet. <clears throat> so this, <clears throat> an average uh, field supervisor has maybe 15 or 20, maybe 25 field interviewers reporting to them. And typically, um, supervisors have a telephone conversation with each of those interviewers once a week that may last half an hour, may last an hour, covering all their casework, what they did in the last week, what they're planning to do, discussing, discussing any problems with their production, their costs or quality. And the rest of their week is often spent kind of um, pouring through reports, investigating problems, <clears throat> um, uh, communicating with the central office about sort of general goals and where the project is at, changes in, in the project, um, uh, planning disciplinary issues, like if an interviewer has to be dismissed for some reason for poor performance or, or whatever. <clears throat> and, we were a little surprised at how well received this one was. Um, just having the photographs of the person being reminded of what they look like after a training when you might have met 200 people, um, like for this project, um, supervisors found helpful. This, these pictures were just taken from their ID badges. Um, um, and then, uh, so their names, where they're from. Um, we also took advantage of the um, information from the mobile device to illustrate what they were doing at the time. So these colored um, 
fields, these highlighted fields at the bottom indicate the last time they had their mobile phone on and what activity of several that they indicate they were doing, like traveling or uh, interviewing and so on. So it gave the supervisor for the first time a sense of right this minute, what are my people doing? Where are they? The kind of thing that you sort of take for granted if your staff is all co-located with you in a building, um, but is much more difficult when you're looking at a kind of completely disconnected field staff. Um, so it was just very powerful for them to have that in their hands for the first time. The um, mobile data that this was based on um, was another effort that we um, engaged in this year, starting with this project. The uh, iPhones had part of an, an app with two components to it. It had a record of contact attempts, um, something that they had on their laptops all the time, um, traditionally year in, year out, entering what happened with each visit, each attempt to uh, reach the respondent, um, whether it was a refusal, a completed interview, and so on. Um, and so we, th that data is notoriously uh, poor quality. It's usually um, completed by the interviewer when they get home at the end of the day. They may have visited 20 or 30 different um, households um, and may be trying to remember or looking at scraps of paper that they noted what the outcome and the time, et cetera, was from each one. Um, and a lot of the time they just forget, I think, to enter um, a, a call. Maybe they made four or five calls over the course of a week and they might fill this out you know, at the end of the week. Um, so this part of the app, the record of contact attempts, was intended to be much easier to use, that taking advantage of what the iPhone knew at the time, who was entering this data, et cetera, um, so that they just had basically to enter the outcome of the contact attempts. So we thought that that would enable them to do, enter a lot of this information on the doorstep as they were making the contact, getting the result, and then entering it. And nowadays, in the US, I assume in Germany as well, seeing someone with a phone just talking into it, you see it all the time. Neighbors don't think anything. It's not a suspicious kind of activity. Whereas if they had a clipboard or even a laptop that they were spending time on the doorstep, you know, it might suggest there's a social worker or a policeman, an investigator, somebody nosy who's doing something that's uh, out of the ordinary. Um, and then the, applica the part of the application that you're seeing here, this visual um, representation, is what they used to indicate what they were doing, whether they were um, doing field work, they were traveling from their home or from one um, uh, sample address to another, and then just a general administrative time, and then a, a place to record how many miles they were traveling. Um, they're paid by the mile, um, as well as by the hour in the, in the U.S. generally, and at West App. Um, the focus here, like with the uh, record of calls information, was to have the design be centered on the user and what's helpful for the user. We wanted to get uh, a very quick acceptance of this as a tool that helped them do their work, as opposed to something imposed from on high that was some extra administrative burden. Um, and so um, for this um, recording of their time, we just had them sort of pushing one of these buttons every time they changed. So they might be traveling for an hour. This would be just running and would show a running count of the seconds, minutes that they were spent doing that activity. And at the end of the day, it would just kind of add it up. The supervisor could see what they were doing, you know, that moment, how they split their time for that day, that week, and so on. So um, the next portlet I want to show you is um, geographic information systems. This is an area that we've been investing a lot in at Westat. We have a kind of subunit, a firm that we acquired several years ago that has about 50 um, geospatial scientists in it. And that was a, a, they were a big help in sort of thinking about our problems here and <clears throat> coming up with visualization that would help in management. This particular view was one of the ones that we made uh, available to field supervisors from that GIS system that just displays where all of their um, interviewers are located. Um, what they found helpful about that um, uh, that kind of surprised us was that they typically just see and know the locations of the interviewers in their regions. But um, it can be important on these large national studies that may have kind of one site where 
there no longer any interviewers working. They you know, had accidents or they quit their jobs or whatever. And there's a need to travel interviewers from other areas in there. And so just deciding, you know, where's the closest interviewer? Um, until they had this kind of a map that showed them from all the regions, this made it very easy to kind of pick out, call that supervisor, you've got a person who's 50 miles away, can I borrow them for a while? Um, but then there are a number of other views into the ge geographical system that they can get to through this portal. They can zero in on a particular interviewer. If the interviewer happens to be working that day, they can see where the interviewer is and what route they have been following for the last couple of hours, what roads they've taken. Um, the interviewer's sample points that they're contacting are displayed um, on the screen. The outcomes of those calls, so it's really a very immediate sense of what that interviewer has been doing in a geospatial rendering um, that, that day. And, um, Supervisors have found that very useful in um, monitoring travel costs for interviewers. They can see um, you know, uh, a route that an interviewer may have taken to hit these cases yesterday that wasn't very efficient and can review with the interviewer um, you know, uh, a more efficient way and then monitor the next day has the interviewer improved their ability to um, navigate. Um, another um, Portlet is looking at costs. Um, this green um, horizontal bar represented what the budget was, and the individual interviewers are these stacked bars. And on the NHATS, there were two different sample types. There were people who continued in the panel starting from 2011, and there was a new sample refreshment um, this year. So new cases that, you know, the, 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 the propensity for the new cases to respond was much lower, of course, than the people who were still with us. And so if you just looked at average you know, hours per completed case, it would mix those two sample types that have very different properties. So although this um, isn't easy for a novice to understand at a glance, these field supervisors who were looking at this information day in, day out, quickly recognized the um, additional information that's provided by the colors on the bars, the breakout of the proportion new sample and old sample. So an interviewer who looked very efficient in hours per complete, may have been doing all these continuing cases and ignoring the new sample part of their caseload. So it gave them a more intelligent way to um, evaluate that information. <coughs> um, and this just takes that data and displays it um, um, on average by the region. Um, the quality portlet I wanted to spend a little time on, um, this is a, a of all the, of the three areas, cost, production, quality, quality is the one that we have the most difficulty vis making visual for the supervisor, even give them any kind of report, let alone a, 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 a one that's compelling visually. And <clears throat> as I mentioned at the beginning, we've invested quite a bit in our carry system, um, behavior coding, um, responses, audio responses, audio uh, uh, instances of asking questions. And this is just one cut at that, at an interviewer level, showing an overall quality rating by the behavior coder of how um, the various recordings we have of that interview, conducting that interview, how, uh, how, that, how well that interviewer performed in terms of asking the questions. Um, and so the number, the uh, x-axis one, two, three, just represents the number of interviews. So you see a trend, is the interviewer improving or not? And um, we emphasized feedback in this process. Um, the um, conduct of the interviewer, the coding of it, um, producing a report from that data, green circles, really are all you know, useful from the interviewer monitoring perspective, improving quality if there's a back uh, loop to it. And we found um, in some other studies, some experiments we've done, that rapid feedback has a very powerful impact. Um, it, it, our goal has been to get feedback to the interviewer within three days of actually conducting the interview. And we thought there might be some pushback from the interviewers on that. You know, why are you watching me? Why are you giving me negative feedback about my performance? Um, and we found quite the opposite, that they welcomed the sense that somebody was watching them, part of a team to improve quality, and they responded very positively to it. Um, a, a sense of being connected with a higher purpose, if you will. <clears throat> on um, Enhance, we implemented an experiment with different kinds of feedback. Um, the three columns represent um, written feedback, 
plus verbal feedback is needed to set in the middle one, written and frequent verbal feedback, so all the time verbal. And then the last one, the kind of standard treatment that interviewers had been getting on this project, which was um, just verbal feedback. And so we randomized the interviewers across these um, conditions and um, found that the combination of written and frequent verbal feedback improved the score on the next interview uh, pretty significantly. Um, and it outperformed both of the other groups by um, quite a margin. So we adopted that as the standard um, approach. Um, the production portlet uh, showing the different kinds of cases that the interviewer has completed, and another production portlet that showed for the region comparison of how they're doing that week against goals were less successful, I would say, than some of the other ones that I've shown you based on um, debriefing sessions with the field supervisor. Um, those need more work, I think, before they can become standard. Here's that alert portlet, the anomalies um, that I mentioned. Um, it is kind of just a, a system a database for tracking problems. So they enter dispositions as they're working through these problems that they have to do with a particular interviewer or data coming from that region and indicate, you know, they're under investigation or I want to postpone this for a couple of weeks and look at it again or I've resolved it. So at the home office, we can look at all the anomalies for a given region um, and see how they're doing. Do they have a big backlog with those? Are they attending to some of this work each day? So that kind of, um, we've, we've been feeding that kind of information to supervisors from time to time in emails or messages, um, memos. Having it in one place that the eye is drawn to each day, I think, was uh, an important part of its success. So um, next steps with this dashboard effort at Westat. Um, we are uh, creating a Portland library, a place where Portland's that we want to become standard for the organization, like this My People one that I started with. We know it was successful on NMAPS. We think it would be successful for any of our CAP projects and probably for other field projects that don't involve interview subjects. <clears throat> so we don't want projects to have to reinvent that. We want them to be in one place where they know this works. You know, this has been um, vetted. Um, and so I just listed the ones that are going into that from this first NHATS experience. We've also established a working group with representatives from throughout the company doing field projects to, um, with the goal of having uh, all of our field projects have some kind of dashboard within a year. So quickly disseminating this um, new technique, new approach throughout the organization. Um, and for each one, um, striving to have the most current actionable information with a compelling display that is kind of making every pixel count. Um, so the current version of it we developed for NHATS is getting some enhancements, if you will, uh, applying it to non-CAPI projects, developing more portlets, particularly for quality, as I mentioned, in production. Um, we've done some enhancements in the My People portlet, the, the photographs across the bottom that the supervisors ask for, which is to kind of take this information and summarize it for a given interviewer. So now they can click on the photograph of that interviewer and bring up all the anomalies for that particular interviewer, um, you know, the geographic information, what they were doing last day, and um, we're using that to do a review each morning with each interviewer of the previous day's work. So by summarizing all this data in one place and making it very easy to communicate it to the interviewer, it's really tightening the field structure a lot. Um, and, and, and making for a lot better accountability um, with these workers. Single sign-on is an important feature of these. Right now, um, they're different databases. When you move from a portlet into the database behind it, you um, typically have to sign in with your credentials, password. That's a pain. It's just a tedious thing you shouldn't have to do. So we've been um, uh, working on single sign-on and are at the point of about to implement it in the next month or so. Um, the mobile app I showed you about what they're doing, uh, how they're splitting out their activities, field work, travel, et cetera. <clears throat> we um, saw some problems with how it was used, acceptance of it, um, just remembering to change it each time. Um, and so we have figured out a way to invert their time by these different chunks using a combination of the CAPI data, which has timestamps when they were actually interviewing, um, and the GPS data that shows where they were at each point in the day that they're working. Shows how you know 
when they were at, at an actual sample unit that didn't result in a complete interview, how much time they were moving, traveling, if you will. And then we know how much total time they've worked by having them indicate you know, when they start working and when they end. So what's left is administrative. So the process <coughs> becomes very kind of just a byproduct of other systems that we have in place. Um, beyond that, um, we'll be working on a second version that I think <coughs> will have different views, a high-level strategic view um, that a project director or a client might find useful that kind of it doesn't just summarize what's going on across the different regions, it's looking at some different data. And then also one for the interviewer. It seems like having this kind of information available for them each day as they work would be helpful. Um, and we'll also be working on dissemination. Um, I think it has value beyond surveys, beyond field work. Um, I'm going to be addressing this quite a bit in a chapter um, I have in the monograph coming up uh, from the Total Survey Air Conference. Um, and there's another chapter in that book that I'm editing from Michigan that in part takes up their dashboard work. So I think the two work very nicely in, in combination. And um, I'm going to be starting to teach a short course in survey management at the Joint Programming Survey Method next spring with Nicole Curtis from the University of Michigan. So I want to bring some of this material to that um, course as well. So thanks. Uh, I'm happy to entertain questions about this work. <laughs>
or saw a captive screen and how it looked for me or left it. And then some other key pair data. Uh, often carry is used to, as a way to detect uh, clues to falsification. You know, if you don't hear a respondent give any answers or even the interviewer asking questions, it's suspicious. Um, and that was, you know, for many years the main purpose of fit carry was developed for. So um, other clues that there might be a falsification problem are useful for this behavior to, to kind of see at once. So if, you know, like an NHAS, the average interview length is two hours in the home. It includes a lot of physical assessments and cognitive assessments, but a good half, more than an hour of just asking questions. <coughs> um, if you see an interview that takes much less than half an hour, something odd is going on there, right? It could be, you know, a problem with the time stamps on the, you know, you just not, it's a smoking gun, it's not the actual, you know, evidence of the crime itself. Um, just to, so, so <clears throat> you could also be concerned about a given question and how it's performing across all the interviewers. It's very easy to just call up all the instances asking those questions. So in our experience, it's very scalable. You know, if you have $10,000 to put into carry recording, you manage that budget and you decide what are your priorities to get out of it, and you can come up with something that's very useful and actionable um, given those resources. Um, if you find a problem that is significant enough, you think it's worth spending more money than you'd planned, um, but it's a clue, you know, it would be helpful, worth it, if you can find some more funds to do that. So that's the way, just what our experience has been with it. Um, so just as a side, um, I didn't go into this in my talk, but uh, one of the most important um, advantages we've had from the GPS is getting much uh, closer to evidence of the actual falsification event. Right? If um, the laptop is in a place other than the respondent's home when the interview was conducted, why? You know, I mean, <clears throat> the first time I saw the power of this GPS for falsification detection was. Um, when we first got the data, and this is a big data issue to assemble all data points and match them up with the survey pair data into meaningful, you know, reports displayed. But you saw, you know, the location, the coordinates for the respondent's home and the interviewer's home, and then you see where the laptop was while the interview was being conducted, and this was somewhere in New England, and the laptop was going somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean. It was like the interviewer was uh, falsifying while they were on a boat somewhere going like to the <laughs> island. So it's very dramatic. Right? Um, but that's an example of the kind of thing that um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty unassailable evidence. The interviewer may have a story that's plausible, but, you know, it's like <laughs> the GPS usually doesn't lie. And that was a question I got from other um, people at cases when I started meetings on Thursday and talking about this. Um, the, there were concerns in the U.S. also, but I think the two cultures are different in terms of you know privacy regulations concerns that come from different places. Um, Westat's legal counsel was concerned about this, and we had several conversations with them. Um, they were reassured that we were on uh, pretty solid ground um, when they realized that. Um, we were only collecting this GPS data when the interviewer was working, when we were paying them for their time, we paid by the hour, and uh, paying them for the activities they're doing. Those activities occur in you know, a spatial area. And so the interviewer has control over when this data is being recorded. I'm starting to work now, so it starts running. I'm going to take a lunch break. I'm stopping working. So where they have lunch or what they did, you know, that's not part of the data base that we're collecting. So I think that um, in the U.S. context was enough to um, to satisfy any, any courts. That's not to say that there wouldn't be some pushback from interviewers, 
but just like with the carry data, we're trying to use the same approach where it's to improve the quality overall of what we're doing and to build them into the team. So this idea I mentioned of kind of looking at the efficiency of a route, you know, that can present, be presented in a way by a supervisor that's very kind of punitive, but it can also be presented, it's like here's an opportunity for us to figure out how to be more efficient so that you know, West Beth can get more business like this, right? So um, I think it can work both ways, and I've seen it work both ways in different organizations. Um, so we've been able to overcome the energy or pushback about it. Now that's you know, this is very new. Um, um, we haven't had any lawsuits about it, so you know, the final story perhaps isn't written in the US, but um, uh, it just it's very common to use GPS everywhere. Um, you know, navigation systems in cars use it all the time. This workforce, you know, a number of them didn't have access to navigation systems, didn't have navigation in their own automobiles, didn't have a smartphone in it. So just that purpose alone, giving them this smartphone with the navigation ability, won a lot of those people over. You know, they could you know rely on the GPS to suggest the most efficient route to work their cases. Uh, Well, you know, this is a combination of a lot of streams of activity, what I've showed you. And I've tried to make that clear. So I don't think that there's any solution likely to be effective that's kind of out of the box. You know, Westhead is in the business of creating such things and selling them. You know, we created this for our own purposes to become more efficient. But we also have an obligation in the field to report innovations that we think, you know, advance the field. And, you know, from other presentations I've done of this, um, I know it's something that seems very attractive to other survey organizations, and I've given them enough sense of our development approach that they could follow in those steps and do it more quickly for them than we could. And, you know, some some you know uh, missteps that they might avoid by hearing our you know pioneering story on it. I think the thing that maybe uh, the biggest hurdle to getting there for a lot of organizations is the GPS work. Because we had the advantage of this <clears throat> required several years ago with these geospatial scientists, data scientists, working with um, geodata. So that gave us some advantage. Even though it was difficult, it took a good I don't know, six months or a year of working closely with them to reach the point of the map that I showed you. Um, I think other organizations that don't have that advantage, you know, the, 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 the expertise is out there. But acquiring it and linking it up with the survey pair data management management systems um, is is a bit of a challenge. But that's not the absolute key thing. It certainly adds a lot. But I think other aspects of the mobile connection add a lot. Um, I think the carry data, which is independent of either of those, adds a lot. And and so the idea of using a dashboard that brings key performance data together, whatever that data is however you define it, I think is an advancement that any organization could pick up. And they don't need to go to some dashboard firm that's selling a canned dashboard to get that. I think that, the, that they could find ways just like we did to bring it together into one screen. Well, I have a question. It's not related to your dashboard, but you showed us something about We started uh, this um, idea of providing the interviewers with smartphones um, maybe early last year, um, even longer, maybe two years ago, and tested it with um, several different sort of small pilot projects. Interviewers we started with just one interviewer and had them go out for using it. And you know, we 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 had the notion that there were these two components that we were most interested in. One. Very little was known about how the interviewer spends their time, right? It's often a big cost component of field surveys. We may know, we know that hours the interviewer is charging because we pay by the hour, so they're billing us for them. And we know that the interview takes, like I said, two hours on this particular project. 
but their average cost is like you know, 10 hours, say, per completed interview. So what, how, what's the, what are they doing the rest of that time? Clearly, they're traveling somewhere. How much of their time is spent traveling? How much is spent? I've worked on some studies that had very heavy administrative burdens, lots of reports that the interviewers had to file. Is it really worth it? How much time is that taking? All of that was kind of you know black box to us, and so we wanted to get some insights on with this app about how that works, um, and then the record of call data, that, the record of contact attempts, is also notoriously bad quality. So we want to develop an app that would help to address that problem. We had um, a member of our staff join us about four years ago, maybe, who is an expert in mobile systems development and come to our company with a lot of that kind of experience. He had former colleagues who were out with their own companies developing apps to do all kinds of things. Um, so it was very, um, and, and he had a staff of people that were available to us. So we were able to iterate pretty quickly. We decided just for convenience sake to focus on iPhones, but we now have that staff um, uh, adapting it to Android devices, which we might think in the long run would be cheaper to apply them to. He has colleagues who do a lot of questionnaire development on smartphones. You know, sort of market research, that's a very common kind of um, you know, quick, uh, easy way to do it. And it, those kind of apps are available uh, to the public for lots of different kinds of things, activities, not just data collection. So we kind of patterned and built on that work for uh, creating this app. Is that? Are you using it now? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, the only survey so far that's used it is this NHATS survey that I talked about. Mm -hmm. um, we have bids outstanding that um, you know call out using it. Uh, one of the challenges we have in applying it to a lot of other surveys right now is the cost uh, structure. Um, in the U.S., uh, when we uh, developed this idea, we the the phone cost was typically bundled by the providers in the data service charge, the monthly charge, which was high. It was like $60, $80 a month. Um, so it was a significant added cost. We had to prove that this had enough efficiency gains to justify that pretty steep um, cost. Um, when we looked at how much actual data the interviewers were transmitting, it was like 1,000. I mean, you know, that $80 could have paid for 1,000 times more data than we were using. So cost structure didn't benefit us. Fortunately, we're keep, keeping track of changes in the cost structure, and the market is changing now so that uh, it's becoming more common to have to pay a price that's like $500 for an iPhone um, to separate out the data service charge and, and, and scale it more to the user's needs. So we're kind of hopeful that that will turn into a much cheaper plan for the data service than we can buy the equipment separate, separately and amortize it over time over a number of projects. So that's the kind of direction we're thinking of moving this into. Can I ask you another question? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so one of the call the, uh, the calls of the interview here positive uh, results from the app like you said you done one of the positive things is that you could follow up the interviewers and check how many contacts you do, what time of day and this other. Mm -hmm. So did you have any results from <coughs> Um, we are just beginning to analyze that data now. Um, we're doing things like, um, well, just comparing. We have some interviewers that didn't use the iPhone app much at all. They did all their entries of these call record attempts in the conventional way on laptops at the end of the day. And so <clears throat> how did the quality of their data compare to last year when they did it, compared to interviewers who used the app this year, who used the old way last year? Um, how much keeping is there? Um, you know, uh, since the iPhone can capture the actual time the entry was made, which is supposed to be very close to the actual, so that will give you exact minutes. But there's also it would predict keeping at five minutes, half an hour, etc., which is one maybe indicator of some kind of quality. Um, and then just total number of call record attempts compared with you know those that didn't use it very much. So, I mean, those are some angles that we're mm -hmm. pursuing now. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. Um, okay, that's great. Uh, I would just have a short question. Uh, 